Good afternoon. I was um, charged with talking about the treatment of chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. So uh, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, also called chronic nonbacterial osteomyelitis, or CNO. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, so it's an autoinflammatory disease, hence why we're here, um, that it predominantly occurs in children, um, more often girls than boys. They present with bone pain, uh, with or without fever. And they, um, about 80 to 90 percent, ultimately will develop multifocal bone lesions, although some start with just one spot. Um, it is often recurrent, but can be chronic and persistent. And um, x-rays, when they're positive, which isn't always, um, can show this classic look of an osteolytic lesion surrounded by sclerosis, abutting a growth plate, here we've got it in the distal tibia, the distal fibula, as well as multiple bones in the feet. So this shows um, a pretty typical looking uh, image. Cultures are nearly uniformly negative. Um, there's uh, no response to antibiotics, except there's been some reports of some um, mild improvement with azithromycin, um, but it also has anti-inflammatory effects as well as antibacterial effects. And um, there are a couple of diagnostic criteria, which I won't go over today, uh, but neither have been validated. So one of the things that's interesting about uh, CNO or CRMO is that um, it is associated with psoriasis, um, up to 10% uh, in some series, and palmar plantar pustulosis, another neutrophilic uh, skin disorder um, that uh, can be seen as well in um, uh, patients with CNO. Inflammatory bowel disease can occur, occur in about 10%. Uh, and so uh, these uh, is somebody who had inflammatory bowel disease and also had these um, osteolytic lesions. Um, Crohn's disease is more common than ulcerative colitis. Um, and sometimes we'll see celiac disease, but I'm not quite clear that the incidence of celiac disease in this disease is more than in the general population. So um, how do you work these kids up? Um, we really don't have very good tests. Um, in fact, all of the labs can be normal. Uh, and so it really is one of those diagnoses and diseases where you have to have a high index of suspicion and have some good background knowledge uh, to uh, uh, be able to, be, um, to look further when you're suspicious, even if uh, your CBC and SED rate and CRP are normal. So the typical workup, um, uh, uh, you might have a mildly elevated white count. Um, marked elevation of SED rate or CRP often will make you think that maybe this child has inflammatory bowel disease in addition to CNO. Um, but most of the time, the SED rate CRP are normal to mildly elevated. Biopsies, which are, don't uniformly have to be done, uh, but um, I think uh, requires uh, probably an expert in the field to be comfortable enough not to do one in the right circumstances. But when uh, you biopsy, it can be done for many reasons. And one is to make sure you don't have a malignancy. Uh, and another is to make sure you don't have an infection. And then um, what we see here is um, osteomyelitis. So this is a, a piece of dead bone uh, with a mixed inflammatory infiltrate. The cells that are present depend on the timing of when you do it. So a new lesion is more likely to be neutrophilic. An old lesion is more likely to have a, a mixed uh, lymphocytic infiltrate. So we talked about plain films a little bit when I showed you that uh, first slide. So osteolytic lesions, sometimes just sclerotic lesions. Uh, they affect the long bones predominantly, but can affect the clavicle, the spine, the pelvis, mandible, and really can do almost any bone in the body. Uh, whole body imaging of some sort is very, very critical to making a diagnosis. Uh, MRI of the whole body with STIR images is the most sensitive uh, way to uh, look for uh, multifocal bone lesions, because a lot of times these children will present with one painful spot, but yet when you look um, with whole body imaging, we'll have many more. For places that don't have a whole body uh, MRI capabilities, then um, doing localized MRI um, is important. And um, to do whole body imaging, if you have 
only nuclear um, medicine bone scans. Um, that, that's what you use. You have to just remember that it's not very sensitive, that those growth plates that light up and are black um, on a normal childhood bone uh, scan um, are the places that uh, CNO like to go. And so um, if you have um, symmetric uh, lesions at the growth plates of the distal femurs, that bone scan could very well be read as normal uh, by the nuclear medicine radiologist when, in fact, if you did the MRI, there would be lesions there. So the ideal world, a whole body MRI, and um, we do ours only with stir images when we're screening for additional bone lesions. So the differential diagnosis, I see a lot of children who come to me who end up having CRMO who spent quite a long time with their general pediatrician being told they had uh, groin pains. And the reason for this is that the pain is typically um, worse at night. Um, and oftentimes, there is no objective change. So the inflammation is in the bone, but um, there's a lot of tissue outside of the bone. And so you can't detect warmth, swelling, or, or, or redness uh, frequently. When you do, it's helpful. Um, and it can mimic an inflammatory arthritis sometimes. And that's why imaging is so important. Um, infectious osteomyelitis um, is uh, the main thing to consider in the differential diagnosis. And one of the things that can help you to think more about CNO is that um, the inflammatory markers are frequently lower in CNO than you would see in infectious osteomyelitis. Also, um, there seems, on average, to be less pain. Um, kids with osteomyelitis may not um, want to put weight on a limb. And most of the kids with CNO will. Um, so just uh, looking um, less inflammatory markers and looking more well than a child with an infection. Malignancy is the big thing that we really have to think about and worry about. Um, and one of the things that you can see here, this is a child who had an intraosseous lymphoma. And the key feature here is that these, bone, these uh, plain films show osteolytic lesion, but it's missing the surrounding sclerosis. And also up here, which is a little bit difficult to see, um, there's a cortical disruption. And so those things are very big red flags that this is a, a malignancy. And you definitely need to biopsy this person and maybe biopsy them multiple times if you're not getting the first answer, if you really are concerned it's cancer. I think this child was biopsied at least three times um, prior to getting that lymphoma. Hypophosphatasia. If you do an alkaline phosphatase, that's a good screen for hypophosphatasia. Um, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, I've seen it. Um, uh, misdiagnosed as this, it does have a, tip, a, a very different radiologic appearance. So I think um, with a good pediatric radiologist, or definitely with a good pediatric musculoskeletal radiologist, usually you can get uh, um, uh, um, some information that that's not it. And then primary immune deficiency. So kids um, uh, can present who have primary immune deficiency with more um, dysregulation of the immune system rather than presenting with infections. And so we have seen uh, kids with uh, primary immune deficiencies presenting with multifocal bone lesions that ended up having, um, for instance, we had somebody who had a RAG deficiency. So here's some more imaging. Um, plain films, uh, when they're positive, can be helpful. This is um, uh, here a sclerotic first rib. Um, here we have um, a plain film that shows a fibular lesion, but it's kind of subtle. A lot of people might not see that. In, um, and, uh, and pick it up. But if you do an MRI, it is clearly abnormal. And that's why MRI is so helpful. Here is a, a clavicle. And clavicles are one of those typical lesions. So if you see osteolytic lesions with sclerosis or hyperostosis, without cortical disruption, without a mass, and without what looks like um, interwoven bone, this is CRMO or CNO until proven otherwise. This is, um, this is kind of one of those pathognomonic things. Here's what we look like on CT. And then just also to say that the sacroiliac joints can be frequently involved. So treatment, what are our goals? The goals are to relieve pain and swelling, to prevent damage, to promote healing and remodeling, to preserve or regain function, and to improve outcomes. Uh, these are the treatments that have been utilized. Everything's empiric. There is no FDA-approved medication. Um, and so we are really left with um, kind of uh, what seems to work uh, in case series. And um, there's only a couple prospective um, studies, and they're small. 
So uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the first-line treatment. I think most people would agree on that. Um, and there is one prospective open-label trial. Corticosteroids are used by some groups to bridge um, uh, until other medications start working. But I would just warn you that you've got, you should be very confident that you don't have a lymphoma, uh, because that would partially treat it and really change their prognosis. Um, Disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs are used by a lot of pediatric rheumatologists. Um, their efficacy seems to be less than if you uh, would go on to use a cytokine blocker, such as a TNF inhibitor. There's less information about IL-1 blockers or bisphosphonate. And then uh, some of the surgeons will decorticate the lesions. Um, I'm not going to talk about a surgical approach. So NSAIDs are the first line. There was a prospective open-label trial by Beck. It was a cohort of 37 with naproxen, uh, 15 per kilo per day for the first year of disease. And 43% reported a clinical response. The number of radiologic lesions went down from 184 total of the group down to 81 at one year. Um, there were four or about 10% that had to switch out, and they switched to sulfosalazine due to no response from the NSAID. And the weakness of this study is there's really no control group, and we know that CNO can spontaneously remit. And so that um, uh, makes it just a little bit hard when we don't have a control group. There's also, um, just to show you that there's lots of different treatments, this is for the Eurofever data, and they have a large number of patients with CNO in this, 486. And what you can see, this stuff is different, you know, what countries uh, participated, how many patients, but here's the summary, easier to see. So 92.5% were on an NSAID. Um, the next uh, most common thing were a lot of them were on antibiotics. So that's usually when you're still thinking infectious osteo. Um, glucocorticoids were used in 25%. And then sulfasalazine, bisphosphonates, and TNF inhibitors, um, you know, around 7.5 to um, 11%. And here methotrexate um, was 17% were used. So... Um, CARA, the CARA CNO group, decided to uh, try to see if they could get some information on what physicians were doing um, with the diagnosis and treatment of CNO. They survey sent um, to 364 CARA members, and that was 277 attendings and then um, almost 90 trainees. 140-ish, 139 responded. Uh, the trainees were removed. 120 responses from attending physicians were had. 12 responses were removed um, because of incomplete data, or they said they lacked experience to make the decision. So we had 109 respondents. And there, um, the second choice, so if you fail NSAIDs, the question was, if you fail NSAIDs, what do you do? And interestingly, the second choice here was methotrexate. So 67% would use methotrexate. Uh, TNF inhibitors at 65%. What's a little bit muddy is that sometimes people use the TNF and methotrexate together. Um, sometimes it's simply to try to avoid um, the potential of getting antibodies to your TNF inhibitor. Um, bisphosphonates were 45% uh, here. Steroids were used in about 30%, and sulfasalazine at 21%. So you can see that that's kind of a lot of different things. Um, so there's really no consensus on what to do for second-line treatment. There's a prospective bisphosphonate study, and um, it was open label. It's done by Pavi Metinen, and she did either monthly or three days in a row every three months. Um, she did an MRI at base line, and, a, and then after the second treatment, she continued this until resolution of the bone signal and repeated if she fl if it flared. There were nine patients. Um, um, six of nine got the monthly. Three um, got the three days in a row. They had a cumulative dose of 5 milligrams per kilogram per year. And the time to greater than 90% resolution of the MRI signal was six months. Um, and uh, five cycles were required for greater than 90% resolution of the bone lesions. And all of them that had soft tissue inflammation um, had resolution of that. And uh, half of them had myalgia and fever, which is very common side effect. That was the main side effect. And um, about half relapsed, and it took about a year to relapse on average. So here is some information on three tertiary care centers in the United States on response to treatment. This is antibiotics. So um, black is ineffective. Uh, uh, the hash marks are um, partial. And then these dots up here are clinical remission. So what you can see is antibiotics, not a good response. Here's NSAID. So you can see here that um, there are very few that uh, got clinical remission on NSAIDs alone. This is retrospective, so that's its, its weakness. Um, 
And what you can see here is that methotrexate um, uh, a lot had partial response, but not very many clinical remission. The TNF inhibitors um, here were the most likely to do a clinical remission, uh, followed by corticosteroids. Response to therapy in a Dresden cohort, cohort, cohort at 12 months, 61% on NSAIDs um, had complete clinical remission. Corticosteroids, 22%. TNF inhibitor, 100%. Bisphosphonates, 83%. A UK co cohort, it's the same sort of thing. You'll see not uh, NSAIDs not uh, likely to have um, a full response rate, so 60% here. Bisphosphonates. Um, and uh, TNF inhibitors um, are the ones that come up uh, next as the most likely to have a good response. And this is in Eurofever data, which shows, again, similar things. So what uh, our studies are looking like, um, and they do have some limitations, um, is that um, the TNF inhibitors and bisphosphonates seem to be the best second-line therapy for getting more partial and complete responses. And um, I just want to make sure that people know that spine disease, typically uh, most experts would go to a bisphosphonate rather than a TNF inhibitor uh, to try to preserve vertebral height um, and to prevent vertebral body collapse, which can be one of the permanent damages. So um, this just shows more. TNF, 61% had a good or partial response in, in those case studies. So what we have here... Um, NSAIDs versus methotrexate plus a TNF inhibitor and a bisphosphonate, um, and that would be called aggressive treatment if you did methotrexate, TNF, and a bisphosphonate. And they were given for persistent disease or vertebral body lesions. And um, looking at um, markers of pain, physical function, physician global inflammatory markers, non-vertebral inflammatory lesions, and maximum edema, all of those statistically improved over the um, duration of this uh, uh, study. NSAIDs alone, none of these things improved. The only thing that improved was soft tissue inflammation. So there is one study on IL-1 inhibition, and um, they, they studied nine patients, and they all had inflammatory uh, disease, so most had a SED rate and CRP. 77 bone lesions at baseline, um, and so they uh, treated with Anna Kenra, and the average was 1.7 years of follow-up. Um, 42 um, lesions resolved, 35 were stable, and um, 20 new lesions were present. The physician global improved um, to none or mild disease in half. The CRP and SED rate improved in all but one. So I'm going to skip that. Um, and just let you know that CNO has a variable outcome, even if you don't treat. This patient, I think, was treated with NSAIDs over time and healed. Um, the uh, likelihood of having persistent disease over a decade um, went from a 0% in a German cohort to 100% in a Dutch cohort and everywhere in between. So we have lots to learn. The biggest complications that we want to avoid are pathologic fractures and leg length discrepancies. So to conclude, treatment of CRMO, it's based on case reports predominantly in case series and registry data. There's only a few open-label prospective trials. Um, there's a significant variation in treatment for second-line therapy amongst experts and pediatric radiologists. I met pediatric rheumatologists across the country and the world. And um, we really need to define the best treatment, um, particularly for NSAID failures. Thank you. <laughs>